Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study with the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and I am Pastor Lydia Evelyn Spragan. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come this morning asking you as always to send your Holy Spirit. This is our last Bible study for the year 2020 and what a year it has been. But Father God, we thank you that through it all, you have kept us. You have kept us from hurt, harm, and danger. You have kept us, Father God, with peace of mind, peace of soul. You have kept us, Father God, with your grace and your mercy. You have kept us, Father God, with your love. You have kept us, Father God, with the knowledge that we are not alone, for you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And so, Father God, we come to this last Bible study of this year. Father God, thanking you for all that you have done for us and for all that we expect that you are going to do for us in the year 2021. We don't know, y'all, Father, what it may yet bring. But Father God, we ask that you would give us the faith to walk by sight, not by faith, not by sight, Father God, but to walk, Father God, by faith. Father God, this morning, clarify our minds. Put us in a place, Father God, where your Holy Spirit can use us. Allow us, Father God, to speak the words that you would have us to speak. Send now your Holy Spirit, Father God, to teach us what he would have us to know. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Good morning, Sister Sheila. Good morning, Sister Shirley. Um, can one of you let me know if you can hear me okay? Today, we are going to talk about a subject that a lot of us really need to talk about more, but we don't really like talking about it. And that subject is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You may have heard someone utter the words, I can never forgive him, or why should I ever forgive you? What the person probably doesn't realize is that he or she is only hurting him or herself by refusing to forgive. Forgiveness is an important part of stress management and keeps a person focused on productive things. If you lack the ability to forgive even the smallest things, you may very well be killing yourself a little bit each day. The impact on your health could be as devastating as the impact of other slow killers such as obesity, smoking, or diabetes. Get a hand, handle on your resentment towards others by truly forgiving others and do it for yourself. Improve your quality of life by freeing yourself of the thoughts that drain your resources. Chances are that if you feel drained every day, you may feel better if you are able to forgive someone who you need to forgive. Now let us turn in our Bibles to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew the 18th chapter. And let's turn to the 21st verse. And today I'm going to be reading from uh, the New King James Version. Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 18th verse.
And it begins. Well, actually, I'm going to back up to the 15th verse. The 15th verse. Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to bear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, here's where we're going to focus. Verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything, they ask, that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, if you don't know what a talent is, don't worry about it. Just change it to $10,000, okay? But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, just say a dollar. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me now. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the fortuners until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you 
if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I want to start off by giving you 13 reasons, the baker's dozen, of why we need to forgive others. In number one, in order to receive forgiveness for our sins, we need to forgive others. Number two, forgiving others allows us to overcome feelings of anger, bitterness, or revenge. Number three, forgiveness can heal spiritual wounds and bring the peace and love that only God can give. Number four, it can damage your health. Number five, it can damage your relationships. Number six, it definitely wastes your time. Number seven, it wastes other people's time. Number eight, it wastes your energy. Number nine, it wastes other people's energy. Number 10, it doesn't feel good. Number 11, it allows other people to control you. Number 12, it limits your options. And number 13, you have been forgiven in the past. Now, forgiveness is a difficult word to hear because we find forgiveness difficult both to receive and to give. However, it is also an urgent word because receiving and giving forgiveness is central to our faith. First, we have received God's forgiveness. We can pass on only that which we have received. Having experienced forgiveness at the hands of God and God's people, we are then called to make it possible for others to experience it. Thus the circle of Christ's love expands ever wider to incept encircle one more lost sheep and another and another. This is not cheap grace. Jesus isn't suggesting that we regard offenses as unimportant. Nor is he suggesting that we wink at sin. He is calling us to take sin seriously and then to take forgiveness equally seriously. Verses 15 through 20 tell us how seriously we are to take these violations. And verse 21 through 35 tell us how gracefully we are to deal with them. Now, let's look at it again. And give me a minute here because I want to look at something else before I go to that. And make sure, because I'm hearing something in my head, and I want to make sure that what I'm hearing is not pertinent or is pertinent. So let me look at that right quick. Hold on. Okay, I don't know why that came up in my head, but I will uh, look at it when we get off of here. Now, when we look at it, Jesus is saying, brother, Jesus is talking about the church family, not 
outsiders, not outsiders. And this is how we are supposed to act. How many times? How many times are we are to forgive? Seven times. Now, let's look at Matthew again here. The 18th chapter. Because we're going to walk it through. The 21st verse. Now, I have a different version for the study than I have for my actual Bible that I'm using. So, I'm, I believe that I'm using the King James for the actual study. But I'm using the New King James for my actual reading material here. So, seven times. Rather than listening for Jesus' answer, Peter proposes his own. Now, have you ever done that? You ask Jesus a question and then before Jesus can answer it, you give your own interpretation of what you think it ought to be. Because the question in verse 20 says, 21 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, he didn't give Jesus time to answer. He answers himself. He says, up to seven times. Now, Peter didn't say, how, how often should I believe, give the stranger? How often should I give uh, my neighbor? But my brother, my brother. So he's talking about people inside the church or inside the fellowship. Folk who call themselves Christians. And occasionally, I say they fall off the, the, the edge. You know, I'm walking on the edge of the gut and occasionally I fall in. So they fell in here and they messed up. And somehow or another, they've done something to offend you. And Peter wants to know, for those folk, how often shall I forgive them? Now, he didn't wait. He just proposes seven times. Seven is generous to the rabbinical standard was three and that was based on Amos 1 and 2 so let's look at Amos Amos is in the Old Testament and um, first chapter and the second verse And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastors of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Verse 3. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed, threshed Gilead with implements of of iron. Now, so here Amos is telling us that we have three transgressions. Three transgressions. For three transgressions, for four, I will not turn away punishment. A phrase repeated several times in those chapters. So if you've not read Amos, you want to read Amos and look for for three transgressions. For four, I will not turn away punishment. The idea is that God forgives three sins and punishes the fourth. Peter senses that Jesus wants the disciples to extend themselves even further. So he doubles the standard and then adds one for good measure. So Peter comes up with seven. And then Jesus comes back and says, I don't tell you until seven times. But until 70 times 7, Jesus' answer demolishes Peter's careful construct. Now, I'm going to spell a Greek word here. H-E-B as in boy, D as in dog, O-M-E-K. O N T A K 
K-I-S space H-E-P-T-A. And that's a, the Greek way of saying either 77 or 70 times 7. 490 times. So either way you look it at in the Greek, Jesus is not adopting man's standard of forgiveness. Peter says, the, the Amos has prophesied three or four. Peter now says seven. Jesus says, no, not seven. But 77 or 70 times seven, 490 times. Now I remember when I was younger, uh, my brother and I had a conversation about this particular verse. And I said, so I'm going to start to keep count. And when they reach uh, 70 times 7, I'm going to be gracious. I'm not going to go with this, the, the translation of 77. When I reach 70 times 7, then I'm going to knock them out. <laughs> and my brother said, I don't think we're supposed to keep track of how many times. And I said, but it says 70 times 7. He says, won't you get tired of keeping record of all the wrongs that's done to you? He said, and what if you don't have the, the little book available when one or two, three people, he said, do something to you? He said, are you going to remember all of those and write them down too? He said, somewhere along the way, your record going to get messed up. He said, and you can't keep track of all them wrongs. He said, for first of all, he said, it, 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 it's going to cause you, he said, to spend a lot of time tracking the wrongs people do to you rather than the right that has been done to you. He said, I would rather keep a book of the rights that people have done to me rather than the wrongs that people have done to me. He said, what do you do? And I thought about it. And as I think about it now, what do you do when somebody you think has wronged you has in fact not wronged you? Somebody else has wronged you. How do you mark that down in your little book and keep it? It is not good for us to keep records. Jesus is not inviting us to keep careful records, but is setting a standard that makes record keeping impractical. You need to write that down. Let me say it again. Jesus is not inviting us to keep careful records, but is setting a standard that makes record keeping impractical. He does not give us a math lesson, but a grace lesson. Write that down. He does not give us a math lesson, but a grace lesson. And I'm going to underline grace lesson here. Who can truly forgive 70 times 7 or even 77 times while keeping track? Who can forgive habitually without becoming a forgiving person? Who can forget the other people's sins while putting chalk marks on the wall? To keep track is not to forgive, but is rather to record progress toward the day when we can quit forgiving. Mm. Not to record progress toward, not to record progress towards our ability to forgive. I done forgave him 399 times. No. We are keeping track of the day when we can quit forgiving. Lord, he's at 
399 and one more 400 and then all I need is 90 more and I can stop forgiving this 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 man and I can do what I want to do <laughs> we can't do it in our heads we can't do it 70 times 7 is 490 we can do it in our heads but what Jesus proposes is celestial arithmetic. We must do it in our hearts. We must do it in our hearts. Hmm. In our hearts. I can forgive, but I can't forget. Okay. Did you forgive him from your heart? Yet, has your heart been changed, transformed, if you will? The numbers 70 and 77, 7 and 77, may have their roots in Genesis 4. There God pronounces sevenfold vengeance on anyone who kills Cain. And that's in Genesis 4, verse 15. And Lamech expands it to 77-fold for anyone who might kill Lamech. In verse 24, if the numbers 7 and 77 in Matthew 18 are derived from Genesis 4, they provide an ironic twist. In Genesis, the numbers refer to vengeance. In Matthew, they refer to forgiveness. So if you look up Genesis 4, 15, or Genesis 4, 24, it's talking about vengeance. But here, the number 7 is they refer to forgiveness. Now that's something to think about. Let's look at verses 23 through 27 in chapter 18 of Matthew. Now, this is the parable. The debt, 10,000 talents, is a measure beyond measure. Now, I told you to think of it as uh, $10,000. But it's more like our word, zillions. We can't imagine zillions. A talent is the largest unit of money in New Testament times. Equivalent to 6,000 denarii. A denarius being a day's wages for an ordinary laborer. 10,000, and the word, the Greek word there is myrias. M-Y-R-A-I-A-S. Myrias. Hold on. <clears throat> Forgot to plug in my computer. You know what? That's when I know that this is a good subject because dumb things start to happen around me. Amen. All right. Myrias. M-Y-R-I-A-S. 10,000 is the largest number for which the Greeks have a word. When Jesus says 10,000 talents, he multiplies the largest unit of money by the largest Greek number, and the result is unimaginably large, the equivalent of a working man's wages for 60 million days or 200,000 years. The annual tax income for all of Herod and Herod's great territories, Herod the Great's territories, was 900 talents per year. So we know that he was a wealthy man, and yet his tax debt only came to 900 talents. And Jesus is talking about 10,000 talents. That's a number that we can't believe. But if it matters, but it matters not whether it is one talent or 10,000. No slave has any hope of paying either of those amounts. 
When one is in hot water over one's head, it matters not whether the depth is a hundred feet or ten thousand, both are deadly. In this gospel, Jesus also equates sin to debt in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts. And here there's another Greek word. O P H. P is in, in Paul. O P H. E I L E M A T A. Something old. Morally a fault. Forgive us our debts. Something owed. Morally a fault. As we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our shortcomings. God. As we forgive others shortcomings. Hmm. But because he couldn't pay. His Lord commanded him to be sold with his wife, his children, and all that he had and payment to be made. The king orders the slave to be sold along with his wife and children, a common enough practice in that day, but not by Jews. The revenue would be applied to the debt, but would be a drop in the bucket. In the case of a more modest debt, relatives and friends might collect money to redeem the offender, but that would not be possible with a debt so large. Then he says in verse 26, Lord, have patience with me and I will repay you all. The slave's response is a desperate grasping for straws. He knows that he can never repay the debt. But he is bidding for time. Every day of freedom is one less day of misery. And who knows? The king might change his mind. Or the king might die. Or some unforeseen event might redeem the situation. The situation is hopeless. But who can blame the slave for hoping? Then we get to verse 27. The Lord of that servant being moved with compassion. And here we need to look at another Greek word. And I believe we looked at this word uh, when we studied uh, the book of Philemon. S-P, P is in Paul, L-A-N-C-H-N-I-S. T H E I S. And that Greek word means a bowel deep feeling of compassion. Bowel, B O W E L. Bowel deep feeling of compassion. I mean, it goes all the way through you, deep down inside, beyond your heart, to your very guts. Your very guts, a bow deep feeling of compassion. The Lord of that servant being moved with a very bow deep compassion. Did what? Released him and forgave him the debt. The miracle happens. The king goes far beyond what the slave has asked. He grants not just a little more time but forgiveness of the great debt. He released him. You need to release folk and forgive them. Stop hanging on to them and what they've done to you and how, how upset it is. Give it to God. Release them so that you can forgive them and set yourself free. Don't need to take all of that with you into 2021. Let's look at verse 28 through 30. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. 
The hundred denarii debt is tiny compared with the 10,000 talent debt, but becomes significant when immediate payment is required. 100 denarii represents a working man's wages for 100 days. See Matthew 20 and 2. Matthew 20 and 2. Where a denarius is a day's wages. What ordinary worker has that kind of cash immediately available? Now, put it in something that you can deal with, I, you know, so that you can make it real to you. And you get paid, say, $10 an hour. You work eight hours a day. That's 80, 80, 80 dollars a day for a hundred days that's eight thousand dollars so somebody come up to you and say i want eight thousand dollars right now how many of you actually have eight thousand dollars right now that you can actually give somebody cash money not many of us. And he grabbed him, verse, verse still 28, and he grabbed him and took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. Grabbing the man by the throat ain't going to produce $8,000 that the man does not have. Seizing the debtor by the throat is rough treatment intended to intimidate. So his fellow servant, verse 29, fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Give me a little time. I'll repay it. Isn't that what he said to the king? Give me a little time. I will repay it. The second debtor uses the exact same words that the first debtor used in verse 26 to persuade the king to give him a chance to repay the debt. However, there's a big difference. The first debtor had no chance of ever repaying his debt, his 10,000 talent debt. But it is quite conceivable that the second debtor would be able to pay his 100 denarii debt. All that is needed here is a little patience. And that is what the second debtor is asking. He would not, verse 30, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay back what was due. We cannot imagine the first slave's lack of compassion given his recent narrow escape. But we must keep in mind that this is a contrived story in which everything is exaggerated for effect. The point is the dramatic contrast between the large and the small debts and the king between the king's compassion and the first slave's lack of compassion. The king, even though an important man faced with great issues, was able to relate to the first slave's helplessness, ironically, and willing to make allowances to remedy it. The slave, ironically, only sees the small debt owed him and is willing to make no allowances. The second slave's free plea in verse 29 is nearly a copy of the first slave's plea in verse 25, but the first slave refuses to hear it. Now right here, you ought to be reminded of what God has done for you. When you are holding so much unforgiveness against somebody, you ought to be able to reflect back in your mind and think of the things that God has forgiven you of. 
the things that you keep in the closet, you know, the things that you don't want nobody, nowhere, at no time, in any shape, form, or fashion to know about, to hear about, to even think about. Those are the things for which Christ died and bled so that you might be forgiven. That is a debt so large and so huge that you cannot repay it, and yet so-and-so has stepped on your toe, called you a name, maybe uh took a little something, something from you, and you can't forgive them? And you called yourself a Christian, a little Christ, made in God's image, supposed to act like him, walk like him, talk like him. First Corinthians says, Imitate 11 and 1 says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. How is that imitating Christ? Let's go to verse 31 to 34. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were exceedingly sorrow, sorry. The word here is J-U-P-E-O, the Greek word, J-U-P-E-O, full of sorrow. They weren't just a little sorry, they were full of sorrow. Those who have little, such as these servants, often feel compassion more acutely than those who have much. They are also more sensitive to injustice because they know how it feels to be the victim of injustice. Also, there was an unwritten rule in those days that obligated those whose debts were forgiven to forgive those who owed them money. These servants would expect the forgiven servant to abide by that rule and would be highly offended when he failed to do so. And so the fellow slaves, exceedingly sorrow, full of sorrow, report the injustice to their Lord, Kairos, K-Y-R-I-O-S, a word often used for Jesus as Lord. Then in verse 32 and 33, it says, then his Lord called him in and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant, even as I had mercy on you? Verses 32 and 33. This verse explains why Jesus would require Peter to forgive 70 times seven. Peter has received mercy from God and will require another massive dose of mercy once he has denied Jesus three times. Jesus can require infinite forgiveness of us because we have been infinitely forgiven. As the writer of Ephesians put it, put it in verse in chapter four, Chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving each other. Just as God also in Christ forgave you. Isn't it ironic that it would be Peter that would ask the question? How many times should we forgive? And then say seven Jesus knew Peter, knew him from the hairs on his head until the soles of his feet. He knew things about Peter that Peter did not know himself. He knew that Peter would deny him three times. He knew that Peter would go out and weep bitterly in the hopes that God would forgive him.
haven't you ever done something wrong? Really, really wrong? And it's been so wrong to you that you have cried over it and wept over it and you wanted God to forgive you of it. Sometimes you even tried to make a bargain with God. God, if you forgive me of this, then I will something. Did you keep your part of the bargain? Probably not. But God is faithful. God is faithful. God forgive me. And he does. Shouldn't we have a measure of forgiveness in us toward others when God has been so forgiving toward us? Verse 34. His Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due to him. The unforgiving servant will suffer at the hands of his tormentors until he repays the king all that he owes, 10,000 talents, an enormous debt that he has no hope of ever repaying. In other words, he can expect to suffer at the hands of his tormentors throughout eternity. Unforgiveness can send you to hell. Let me say that again. Unforgiveness can send you to hell. And why go there? When all you simply have to do is forgive here. We enjoy salvation by the grace of God. But this parable warns that God expects us to manifest at least some small portion of that grace in our relationships with our Christian brothers and sisters. Our eternal security is at stake. The parable tells of free grace, but not cheap grace. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. Uh, forgiving them is going to cost you something. But remember, Jesus already paid the price. He paid a debt he did not owe. You owe him. Just a little bit to think about what he has done for you. You're not perfect. You have messed up. You have fallen short. And if you sit there and say, well, I'm all that in the bag of chips. I don't know who you're trying to fool. But you are not fooling God. He knows you. He knows the things you're going to do before you even do it. It's so on the off chance that you're going to screw up big time like Peter. And need a massive dose of forgiveness from God. That ought to be a nudge in the right direction. To forgive this petty stuff. That you're holding on to. Verse 35. Suddenly, Jesus is no longer telling a story about a distant king, but is speaking directly to his disciples and to us. He repeats the warning that he issued earlier in his Sermon on the Mount. There he taught us to ask God to forgive our trespasses, but warned, but if you don't forgive men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now he says that we must forgive from our hearts. Not superficially or half-heartedly. That is the kind of forgiveness, that kind of forgiveness excludes warmth. That is likely to end in an embrace that celebrates the end of the rift. 
Can you actually go up and hug the person who has wronged you? Can you shake hands? Can you look them in the eye when you pass them by? Are you still giving them the cold shoulder? Being standoffish? Muttering under your breath? Thinking in your head crazy things about them? God wants us to issue the kind of forgiveness that ends in an embrace. That celebrates the end of the rift. There is nothing stingy about this forgiveness. Now, there's another part to this lesson and, and I probably could start it. But I want us to do some heart work. H-E-A-R-T work this morning. I want us to take a couple of minutes and look at our own lives. Think about a time or two that we have truly messed up. Said something we didn't intend to say. did something to somebody that we didn't intend to do. Worse yet, said something we intended to say and then wish we had taken it back. Did something to somebody that was the equivalent of stabbing them or murdering them with our tongue. Let's look at our own self. Is there some place in our life that we truly want God to forgive us? Open the closet. Let all the skeletons fall out. Isn't there some place in your life that you want God to forgive you? Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our shortcomings, our mistakes, our messes. If God was to hold those things against us, we would die, die again, end up in hell for eternity. For the wages of sin is death. And death, in that word, is separation from God. In the midst of a hell of our own making. We're going to carry around our sins when God forgives us of them. Our many sins, not just one. Forgive us our trespasses as, like, how we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It's hard, H A R D. But it's heart work, H-E-A-R-T, that we have to do to forgive someone else when we feel that they have wronged us. We don't have to put ourselves in the same place as the domestic abuser. We don't have to put ourselves at the same place as the person who has talked about us like a dog. But we need to spiritually be able to wrap our arms around them. And honestly in our hearts forgive them for what they have done. Just as God has forgiven us. 
I can't do that. If you can't forgive them, then God can't forgive you. It's a simple lesson. It's a simple lesson. Let us pray. Father God, this is the last time that we're going to meet together in this year. And there's some hate, some hate, some hurt, some pains, some heartaches that have caused many of us a great deal of stress and sickness and anxiety and unforgiveness, giving us ulcers, sleepless nights, times when we've actually thought about how we're going to go get them. Instead of remembering that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And knowing that the vengeance of the Lord can be heavier than anything that I could ever conceive of in my mind. Give us, Lord, the opportunity to take a moment today and say, I'm not going to carry that stuff with me into 2021. I myself have to be set free. I don't want the chains of unforgiveness binding me up and sending me to hell. I want to be free, free in my mind. I don't want to give them thought during the year what they done done to me. Because when I give them thought, Lord, it gives them control over me. And I don't want nobody to have control over me except you. And I want you to have sovereign control in my life. I want to be able to think like you, walk like you, act like you, represent you. I want to imitate you in my life. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be a show. I don't want to be a facade. I want to be a real Christ-like individual living by Christ-like principles. Lord, this person really did me in. And Lord, you know they did me in. Lord, I don't know how I can recover from what they did to me. It hurts so bad. But I know that there is nothing impossible with you. Nothing that you cannot do. So Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to let it go. I'm willing, Lord, to, to let it go. Father God, I want to hang on to it. But it's, 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 it's more than I can bear. Father, take this burden away from me. So I can stand up and not be bent over. So that I can look like you, walk like you, talk like you. I know I messed up really bad and you forgave me. Teach me, Father God, how to forgive others. Let me think, Father God about the good things that you have done for me and not the bad things that have happened to me. Father God, teach me how to forgive. And then, Father God, help me to apply what you are teaching me to my own life. Help me to forgive the person who has hurt me who has harmed me, who has ought against me, who talked about me. 
And Father God, as I'm walking in these steps of forgiveness, help me to remember that they spat on you. Help me to remember that they talked about you. Help me to remember that they beat on you. They beat you up so bad, Father God, they whipped you until the flesh fell from your bones. The blood came streaming down. They persecuted and crucified you. And you did no wrong. You were innocent. They placed the crown of thorns on your head. Lord, I can't imagine what it might be like if somebody wrapped a rose bush around my head and then planted it in my skull and pushed down really hard on it. I can't imagine, Father God, the pain you suffered just for me and for my screw-ups and for my mess-ups and for my mistakes and for my downfall. They pierced you in the side. They nailed your hands to a cross. You were in pain. You were hurt. You were crushed. And yet... Somehow or another, you found a way to say, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. It looked to me like they knew what they were doing. They were the one raising the hammers and, and nailing your hands. Who didn't know what they were doing? I didn't know, Father. For while I was out there doing everything that I was big enough and bad enough to do, yet, while I was out there, yet, you loved me. Died in my place. A death you did not deserve. You paid a debt that you did not owe. Father God, help me to forgive my debtors, even as you have forgiven me my debts. My heart work, Father God, requires that you do some heart surgery on me. The kind talked about in Ezekiel 36, that says that you will remove my old stony heart and give me a heart of flesh. A heart that feels and beats. You love me so much, Father God, that you came in the person of Jesus the Christ. You let your heart beat like my heart beat. and die in my place in order that I might have life, abundant life and eternal life. Help me, Father God, to give life to someone else and to myself by forgiving. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. We thank you this morning for tuning in 
And we pray that you have gotten a word. I will uh, put the references on the uh, Facebook page so that you will be able to follow and go through them again. Um, we hope that you had a Merry Christmas and that you will prepare to enter the new year a new creation. Until then, be safe, practice social distancing, wear your mask, wash your hands frequently, and pray. And remember that God really does love you, and so do I. Until next time, next week, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Have a good rest of the year.